It started with an offer that, at first, seemed like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The government had taken an interest in my work and my expertise in the field of sleep science. The day the government contacted me remains as vivid in my memory as if it happened yesterday. I was in my lab, surrounded by stacks of research papers, half-empty coffee cups, and the incessant hum of machines, diligently monitoring the sleeping patterns of lab rats. My life then revolved around REM cycles, circadian rhythms, and insomnia. That morning, the email arrived, hidden amongst the usual slew of science newsletters and vendor promotions. Its subject line, an opportunity of interest, stood out amidst the clutter. The sender was a nondescript .gov address. I remember clicking on it, more out of curiosity than anything else. Subject, an opportunity of interest. Dear Dr. Natalie Garza, we hope this email finds you in good health. We write to you from the Department of Defense, recognizing your pioneering work and profound expertise in the field of sleep science, particularly your research related to insomnia. We are about to embark on a classified and vitally important research project, provisionally named Project Nocturne. The focus of the study is to gain a comprehensive understanding of insomnia, its effects, and potential methods to mitigate or even utilize such conditions for various applications. We believe that your knowledge and experience make you an ideal candidate for leading this project. We assure you that this endeavor has the potential to significantly advance our understanding of sleep disorders and could provide relief for many who struggle with these conditions. However, due to the sensitive nature of this project, we are currently unable to provide more details via email. A representative from our department will be contacting you via phone shortly to discuss this opportunity in more depth and answer any questions you may have. We look forward to potentially working with you and utilizing your expertise to make strides in this important field of study. Sincerely, Agent Michael Richardson, Department of Defense. Suddenly, the phone in my office rings. Dr. Garza speaking, I announced. Good afternoon, Dr. Garza. This is Agent Michael Richardson from the Department of Defense. I trust you've received our email? Yes, I just read it, I replied, glancing over at my computer screen where the message was still open. I'm glad. As the email outlined, we're working on a very important project relating to insomnia, which we believe is well aligned with your area of expertise. Given your exceptional reputation in the field, we thought you would be the ideal candidate to lead this. His words, as flattering as they were, left me with more questions than answers. Your email was intriguing, Agent Richardson, but it lacked specific details. Can you tell me more about what this project entails? I understand your curiosity, Dr. Garza, he responded, his voice steady and professional. Unfortunately, due to the sensitive nature of the study, I'm unable to share further details over the phone. We'd like to arrange a meeting in person where we can discuss everything in detail. We hope this would also give you an opportunity to view the facilities and meet the team. His offer to meet and see the facility was enticing. I had a million questions, and it seemed this was the only way to get answers. After a moment of silence, I made my decision. I appreciate the offer, Agent Richardson. Let's arrange that meeting. Excellent, Dr. Garza. I'm certain you won't regret this decision. I'll have my assistant coordinate with you to schedule a suitable date and time for your visit. Thank you, Agent Richardson. I look forward to learning more about this project, I replied, the curious scientist in me already gearing up for this new, mysterious adventure. The call ends, leaving me in a state of heightened anticipation. After our conversation, I found myself sitting in stunned silence, my brain swirling with thoughts and questions. The idea was a seductive one. All my life, I had been working on sleep disorders the elusive phantom of insomnia being one of my primary areas of interest. How many times had I watched patients struggle with the torment of sleepless nights? How many times had I wished for a breakthrough that could bring them relief? Eventually, curiosity and ambition got the better of me, and I accept the offer. The morning I was scheduled to visit the Nocturne facility, an unmarked black car arrived at my doorstep. A stern-looking man in a crisp suit was behind the wheel, he only offered a curt nod when I approached, not bothering with pleasantries. The ride to the facility was eerily quiet, the silence only broken by the sound of the car engine. The windows were tinted so dark that it was almost impossible to make out anything outside. It felt less like a precautionary measure and more like a strategy to keep the facility's location a secret. 
The ride seemed to last forever, and I could feel the smooth, well-paved city roads give way to the uneven gravel roads of rural Montana. When we finally arrived, I was led through a maze of tall walls, topped with barbed wire. Security was stringent, with CCTV cameras at every corner and guards who watched with hawk-like intensity. We came to a halt in front of a plain-looking building. The structure was featureless, almost deliberately designed to blend into the backdrop of the barren landscape. There were no signs on the outside and no indications of what the building's purpose was. Agent Richardson was there to welcome me. Dr. Garza, he greeted, his voice echoing in the expansive lobby. Welcome to Project Nocturne. After a quick tour of the facility, which left me awestruck and a little overwhelmed, Agent Richardson led me into a spacious conference room. Inside, a group of individuals were gathered around a large, sleek table. I could tell from their alert eyes and the air of anticipation that they were the team I would be working with. Agent Richardson cleared his throat, drawing the room's attention. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Dr. Natalie Garza, the lead for Project Nocturne. Dr. Garza, meet your team. As I looked around the room, I was met with an array of faces, each unique yet united by a common trait, a glint of intellectual curiosity, the telltale mark of a scientist. First, Richardson introduced me to Dr. Rebecca Lee, a neurologist. She had a calm demeanor and sharp eyes that hinted at an analytical mind. Next was Dr. Joshua Klein, a younger researcher with a bright smile and an infectious enthusiasm for neuroscience. Richardson mentioned his groundbreaking work on neural pathways related to sleep. Then I met Dr. Anton Chekhov, a Russian immigrant and a pharmacologist. He had spent years studying the effects of various stimulants on sleep. Next to him was Dr. Lillian Saunders, a clinical psychologist who had worked extensively with insomnia patients. Her kind smile and warm demeanor made her instantly likable. Last but not least was Mary Thompson, a seasoned project manager who had previously overseen several large-scale research projects. The project centered around a group of soldiers, all exceptional, all willing to sacrifice their sleep for the sake of our experiment. The aim was to better understand the effects of prolonged wakefulness. It seemed innocuous at first, an exploration of human boundaries. As I dived deeper into the project, my initial reservations dwindled away, replaced by a scientist's thirst for knowledge and the exhilaration of unraveling the mysteries of the human brain. We adopted a comprehensive and multifaceted approach to examining the impact of sleep deprivation. The daily regimen of our soldier subjects was tightly structured, including a variety of activities designed to push them mentally, physically, and emotionally. Each morning, after a routine health checkup and collection of blood samples, the soldiers would be subjected to a set of cognitive tasks. These ranged from solving complex puzzles to memory tests and required a high level of focus and mental agility. Dr. Klein and Dr. Lee were particularly involved in this aspect, keenly observing the soldiers' performances and looking for any signs of deterioration in their cognitive abilities. Physical exercise was another crucial component the soldiers were made to engage in regular strength and endurance workouts. The idea was not to wear them out physically, the fatigue from sleep deprivation was already doing that, but to assess how their physical capabilities were impacted over time. Social interaction was also an integral part of the routine. They were encouraged to engage with one another, play games, and even discuss their experiences. Dr. Saunders found this particularly useful for her psychological assessments, noting down changes in mood, emotional responses, and any possible hallucinations. To combat the inevitable wave of sleepiness, we administered specially formulated stimulants. These drugs, carefully controlled and measured by Dr. Chekhov, were designed to keep the soldiers awake and alert. Intricate EEG scans and neuroimaging techniques were utilized to monitor the effect of these stimulants on the brain, charting their impact on various neural pathways. The initial few days of the experiment were relatively uneventful. The soldiers, disciplined and well-conditioned, adapted to their new regimen swiftly. They performed their tasks efficiently and interacted in their leisure time, their friendship almost making the sterile environment of the facility feel homely. The effects of sleep deprivation were minor and predictable at this stage. There was increased yawning, slightly slower response times, and an overall sense of fatigue. But as the first week rolled around, 
the impact of chronic wakefulness became more pronounced. The soldier's efficiency began to falter, and their performance in the cognitive and physical tasks deteriorated. Simple puzzles became challenges, and the physical exercises which they had breezed through on the first day became difficult. We noticed the changes in their behavior as well. The spirited conversations they used to have dwindled into brief exchanges. Their laughter faded into silence. The bright spark in their eyes began to dim. Some started displaying signs of irritability, snapping at minor annoyances, while others became more withdrawn. By the end of the second week, the soldiers were almost unrecognizable from the men they were at the start. Their movements had become sluggish, their speech slurred and slow. But what was more disturbing were the psychological effects. They began to experience vivid hallucinations, their sleep-starved brains blurring the line between reality and dreams. Some reported hearing whispers or seeing shadowy figures in the corners of their vision. Sitting across from me was Corporal Harris, one of our test subjects, and a soldier who had always struck me as mentally resilient. The man who sat before me now, however, was a mere shell of that individual. His eyes were bloodshot, with dark circles underlining them, and there was a certain emptiness in his gaze that was deeply unsettling. Corporal Harris, I began, trying to keep my voice steady and reassuring. Can you tell me about what you're experiencing? He remained silent for a moment, his bloodshot eyes staring past me, as if trying to focus on something that wasn't there. The shadows, he finally whispered. His voice was ragged, like a worn out piece of fabric, barely holding itself together. They're always moving, always watching. Can you describe these shadows? I pressed on, attempting to gain a clearer understanding of his hallucinations. They're figures, tall, dark, shapeless. He responded, his eyes darting around the room as if following something. They're silent, but they speak, not with words, but with, with thoughts. I can hear them in my head. His hands started to tremble, and I noticed how his knuckles were white from clutching the arms of the chair. They whisper terrible things, nightmares, fears, all the worst parts of me. And these figures, do they interact with you? I asked, keeping my voice as calm as possible despite the chill running down my spine. He shook his head slowly, his eyes never leaving a point in the room where, to my eyes, nothing existed. No, they just watch. They watch and whisper. Are they here now? I ventured. He nodded, swallowing hard. Always. They're always here. The toll on his psychological state was profoundly evident. Here was a man who had faced real enemies on the battlefield, reduced to a state of paranoia and fear by the shadows of his own sleep-deprived mind. It was a chilling sight, a stark reminder of the power of the human brain and the devastating effects of robbing it of rest. My scientific curiosity was quickly being replaced by a deep sense of dread. We had hoped to unlock new understandings about the human mind, but instead we had unwittingly unleashed a horrifying psychological torment on these soldiers. But the interview that left me shaken the most was with Private Mitchell. Private Mitchell, I began, careful to keep my tone neutral. How are you feeling today? I'm being watched, doctor, he replied swiftly, his voice steady but laced with a potent undertone of suspicion. I'm always being watched. By whom? I asked, studying his expression for any indication of the hallucinations that plagued Corporal Harris. Them, he gestured vaguely around the room. The other soldiers, they're planning something, something sinister. But Mitchell, these men are your friends. What makes you believe they would plot against you? His eyes narrowed, and for a moment, a flicker of the soldier he used to be, confident and decisive, showed through. I've seen them whispering, exchanging glances. They're up to something. Do you feel they mean you harm? He nodded, a hint of fear creeping into his eyes. They're out to get me. Why, I don't know, but they are. The paranoia on his face was chilling. The sleep deprivation was making them see enemies where there were none, turning allies into threats. It was becoming increasingly evident how the lack of sleep was taking a horrific toll on the soldiers' minds. The symptoms they exhibited were consistent with severe psychiatric disorders. 
Yet these weren't lifelong conditions they were suffering from, but the consequences of two weeks of continuous wakefulness. It was late one night, a few weeks into Project Nocturne. The facility was unusually quiet, save for the dull hum of the computers and the soft murmur of my colleagues in the monitoring team. I was in the lab, sifting through the vast amounts of data we were generating, trying to discern patterns and explanations for the disturbing symptoms we were witnessing in the soldiers. My eyes were growing heavy, and the lines of figures on my screen were blurring into meaningless squiggles, but I forced myself to stay awake. Ironically, as I battled my own fatigue, I was immersed in studying the effects of sleep deprivation. When I'd exhausted all the documents on my desk, I decided to venture into the storage room in search of more data files. The room was tucked away behind the main lab, lined with shelves full of binders, data drives, and documents. Navigating through the dimly lit aisles, I came across a cabinet that I hadn't noticed before. Out of curiosity, I reached out and opened the drawer. It was filled with folders marked classified. My heart pounded in my chest and a sense of unease grew within me. This was information that wasn't meant for me, but my desire to understand the puzzling manifestations of the soldiers' conditions overrode my sense of professional boundaries. My hands trembled as I opened one of the files. The document read, Project Nocturne. Classified document for authorized personnel, only purpose of the project. The ultimate objective of Project Nocturne is to develop a group of military personnel who can operate at full capacity without the requirement for sleep. This project aims to advance the human ability to withstand the effects of sleep deprivation, thereby increasing operational efficiency and reducing the logistical constraints associated with rest and sleep during military operations. Procedure. The experiment involves a controlled group of physically and psychologically robust military personnel subjected to prolonged periods of wakefulness. A team of specialized scientists will monitor the subjects and document any changes in cognitive, physical, and psychological behavior. Interventions including pharmacological aids, physical exercise routines, and cognitive behavioral techniques will be employed to combat the effects of sleep deprivation and maintain alertness and functional capabilities. Expected Outcomes An Understanding of the Physiological Limits of Human Sleep Deprivation the development of methods to extend these limits with the aim of producing a force of super soldiers capable of operating without the need for sleep. Analysis of the psychological impact of prolonged wakefulness with the aim of developing preventative strategies or coping mechanisms. Note, the potential benefits of this project to national security and military capabilities are immense. However, the potential risks to the subjects involved are acknowledged. Therefore, every effort will be made to minimize harm while pursuing the project objectives. The project's success relies heavily on the expertise and commitment of the appointed scientific team. Absolute confidentiality and dedication are expected from all team members involved. Authorization, signature, redacted, date, redacted. Position, redacted department, redacted. The detachment with which they talked about risks to subjects and minimizing harm, as if the subjects were mere lab rats and not human beings, sent a chill down my spine. This wasn't just a scientific experiment, it was a dangerous, unethical venture, playing with the very essence of human nature. For a moment, I simply stood there, the classified file in my hands, feeling like a ticking time bomb. I felt like a stranger in a place that I had begun to consider my second home. Every familiar sight now seemed shadowed with an underlying menace. The friendly chatter of my colleagues, the sound of the computers, the steady hum of the ventilation, it all felt like a facade, masking the horrific truth of our work. With a deep breath, I shoved the document back into the folder and the folder back into the drawer. I locked it securely and memorized its location, knowing that I may need to refer to it again. I took one last look around the storage room, my eyes lingering on the harmless looking cabinet before turning off the lights and leaving. As I walked back to the lab, my mind was racing. What did this mean for our work, for the soldiers, for me? What was I going to do now? I had been drawn into this project with promises of groundbreaking sleep research, with the potential to help countless people suffering from insomnia, but the reality was far more sinister 
As the weeks passed by, I observed a profound transformation in the soldiers. Each passing day brought with it a fresh wave of symptoms. The once robust, mentally resilient soldiers were now becoming shells of their former selves. The hallucinations intensified, their frequency and vividness escalated. Soldiers would often jolt from their seats, their eyes wide with terror, staring at empty corners or whispering urgently about creatures only they could see. One claimed he was being chased by a monstrous beast that lurked in the shadows. Another was convinced that the walls were closing in on him, trapping him in a shrinking room. Their perception of reality began to warp, bending under the relentless assault of sleep deprivation. Time lost its meaning for them. Days bled into nights, and hours became indistinguishable from seconds. Some soldiers would sit in silence, their gaze unfocused, lost in a world only they could perceive. Others would suddenly burst into inexplicable laughter or become aggressive without any instigation. Paranoia seeped into their minds like a slow-acting poison. Trust was disintegrated, replaced by suspicion and fear. Every whisper was interpreted as a conspiracy, every sideways glance as an act of betrayal. Friendships that had once been strong were now crumbling under the weight of baseless suspicions. They began to isolate themselves, huddling in corners or sitting alone, their faces pale, their eyes reflecting a deep-seated terror. Their cognitive abilities started to deteriorate as well. Simple tasks became challenges. Complex instructions were met with confusion. I noticed the soldier struggling to tie his shoelaces, his fingers fumbling and his eyes glazed over. Another couldn't remember his name. Their physical health wasn't spared either. Rapid weight loss, pale skin, and trembling hands became the norm. Their movements became jerky and uncoordinated. Even their speech started to slur, their words a jumbled mess, struggling to form coherent sentences. What was most chilling, however, was the change in their personalities. These were men who had once been full of life, brimming with energy and courage. Now, they were barely recognizable. Their spirit, their sense of self, was slowly being eroded, leaving behind a haunting emptiness. Each day, I felt like I was witnessing a slow descent into madness. And despite everything, the project continued. Violent tendencies in the subjects started to become more frequent at around the six-week mark in the project. I remember one incident clearly, where Private Jameson, a normally mild-mannered individual, suddenly turned violent. I was in the observation room, my eyes fixed on the video feed of the common area, when Jameson stood abruptly from the chess game he was losing. Without warning, he overturned the table, sending chess pieces flying across the room. Then, he lunged at his opponent, Corporal Reyes fists swinging wildly. He was shouting something about Reyes plotting against him, his words slurred but filled with conviction and rage. It took several orderlies to pull him off Reyes, and even then he still fought. Another instance involved Sergeant Collins, one of the most disciplined soldiers I had ever met. One evening, as the dinner hour approached, he suddenly began yelling about poison in the food, that it was all a scheme to control their minds. In his paranoia and fear, he threw his tray against the wall, food splattering everywhere. He had to be sedated, his screams echoing through the halls long after he was led away. One of the most horrifying incidents was a younger soldier, Private Thompson, was found in his quarters with self-inflicted wounds. In his sleep-deprived state, he'd hallucinated insects crawling beneath his skin and had taken a piece of broken mirror to try and dig them out. The sight of his bloodied hands and the haunted look in his eyes was one of the most disturbing things I'd ever witnessed. Then came the day when everything went wrong. It was a Tuesday, I think, a day like any other. I was in the lab, poring over some data when the alarm started blaring, a sound that meant that the facility was going into lockdown. Over the intercom, a panicked voice said, Code Black, repeat, we have a Code Black. A Code Black was a violent threat within the facility. My heart pounded in my chest as I made my way to the control room. As I burst into the room, I saw the live feed on the main screen. What I saw will haunt me till the end of my days. One of the subjects, Private Daniels, had somehow come into possession of a kitchen knife and was in the main recreational area. His eyes were wild and terrified. It was clear he had already caused severe harm. Soldiers and staff members lay on the floor, some motionless, others writhing in pain. 
On the screen, Daniels was shouting about being behind enemy lines, about needing to fight for his life. He was slashing the air with the knife, backing into a corner, his eyes darting around wildly. It was a terrifying sight. Agent Richardson was in the room, shouting into a phone for reinforcements. His usual composed demeanor was gone, replaced by panic. The minutes before the response team arrived felt like an eternity. We could do nothing but watch the horror unfold on the screen. When they finally arrived, their attempts to subdue Daniels were met with fierce resistance. In his sleep-deprived state, his fear and adrenaline made him dangerous. It took a tranquilizer dart to finally bring him down. In the aftermath, the rec room was a scene of utter chaos. There were cries of pain, lab coats and military uniforms stained with blood. The staff tried their best to help the injured. We lost two soldiers and a nurse that day, and several others were severely injured. It was a sight that no amount of time or distance could ever erase from my memory. The day after the incident was a blur. There was a deafening silence in the facility. The lockdown was lifted. The rec room had been blocked off, and the blood was cleaned up. Later that day, Agent Richardson arrived with grim news. I was in my office when he knocked on the door. Project Nocturne has been terminated, he announced. The higher-ups have called it off, the consequences. They've deemed them too high. His words, though expected, still hit me like a punch to the gut. The reality of it all, the end of this twisted experiment, was finally setting in. I remember the silence that followed his announcement, the sound of our breathing, the hum of the ventilation system, the ticking of the clock. Time seemed to slow, the world outside coming to a standstill. In the days that followed, the facility was vacated and the soldiers were moved out. I was one of the last to leave. My office was now barren and empty. As I closed the door behind me, I was leaving behind more than just a job. I was leaving behind a piece of me, a part that had been irrevocably scarred by the horrific events that had unfolded. I was haunted by the past, the vacant stares of the soldiers, their chilling hallucinations, and their deteriorating sanity. Their faces appeared in my dreams, their screams filled my nights, and their suffering was a constant reminder of the horrifying toll of our ambition. Project Nocturne was over, but its shadows lingered. The terrifying consequences of the experiment, the cost of crossing the boundary of human endurance, would forever remain imprinted in my mind. I was left with a harsh lesson about the limits of science and the fragility of the human mind a lesson that was learned at a devastating cost. There's an eerie sort of quiet that fills my days now. I've left the world of sleep research behind. I couldn't bear to go back, not after Project Nocturne. I tried, for a while, to lose myself in other areas of research, in academia, but the shadows of the past always loomed too large. The joy I had once found in unraveling the mysteries of the mind had been replaced with a deep-rooted dread, a haunting fear of treading too far, of losing myself in the abyss. These days, I've found a sort of solace in the mundanity of a quieter life. I teach psychology at a small community college. There's a comfort in the regularity, in the eager faces of the students, in their fascination with the workings of the mind. I find myself hoping, time and again, that they never have to experience the horrors that come with pushing too far. When I'm not teaching, I volunteer at a local mental health clinic. It's my way of atoning, I suppose, for the pain I was part of inflicting. I work with people struggling with insomnia and other sleep disorders, trying to help them find peace. The work is hard, and the progress is often slow, but there's a healing in it, a balm for the guilt that still lingers. And yet, despite the passing of time, the ghosts of Project Nocturne still haunt me. I see them in the sleepless eyes of my patients and hear them in the silence of the night. I carry them with me, a reminder of the damage I've inflicted in the name of science. Often, late at night when sleep eludes me, I find myself thinking about the soldiers, about the men whose lives were forever altered by our recklessness. I wonder about their dreams, or rather, their nightmares. I wonder if they too are haunted by those days and sleepless nights, if they too carry the burden of a past that refuses to be forgotten. But through it all, I've found a sort of acceptance, a resigned understanding of the path I've walked. I've come to realize that the scars of the past are a part of me, a dark chapter of my life that helped shape the woman I've become. I've learned to bear the weight of my past, 
to navigate the guilt, the regret, the relentless memories. And in that acceptance, I've found a sense of purpose, a drive to heal, to guide, and to educate.